Good afternoon, everyone. The Long Year Initiative of ISPI and the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. This year marks the seventh edition of ROMED. I would like, uh, first of all, uh, to thank GMF for the precious uh, cooperation in uh, organizing this virtual panel and uh, uh, all panelists uh, uh, that I will introduce uh, in a minute for being uh, with us. A special thank goes to Kadri Tashtan, uh, GMF TOBB Senior Fellow for uh, uh, that will moderate with me this, uh, this panel. My name is Valeria Talbot. I'm co-head of the Middle East and North Africa Center at ISPI. The virtual panel will be divided into uh, two parts. The first one will analyze uh, the Western dimension of Turkey's foreign policy, while the second part will focus more on Ankara's policy towards the Middle East and North Africa. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Evren Balta, Professor of International Relations at the Ozein University and Senior Scholar at the Istanbul Policy Center. Welcome, Evren. And uh, Ian Lesser, Vice President and Executive Director at the GMF. Welcome, Ian. So, thanks. Over the years, the diversification of external relations has been a major feature of Turkey's foreign policy, which has become more and more multidimensional. In this multidimensional policy, the traditional Western allies, the US and Europe, have uh, no longer occupied the central place. Furthermore, bilateral ties uh, have gone through different phases uh, and experienced setbacks uh, and tensions. Nevertheless, both Turkey and uh, its Western allies uh, continue to share crucial geostrategic security and uh, economic interests. Turkey's foreign policy is adapting to both the evolving global scenario and the changing regional order. We will try to understand together with Evren and Ian what are the implications of Turkey's evolving foreign policy on its relations with the US and NATO and the European Union. Starting from uh, Turkey's uh, US relations uh, over the past seven years, uh, the two NATO allies uh, have been on different pages uh, on several uh, critical uh, issues, from uh, US support to Kurdish forces uh, in Syria, to Turkey's acquisition of S-400 defense system from, from Russia, just to mention a couple of, of examples. So uh, Turkish-American ties have faced and are facing uh, several tensions. I would like to, to ask uh, Evren, from a Turkish perspective, how has uh, Turkey's foreign policy towards uh, its uh, Western allies uh, evolved. So what have been uh, the main drivers uh, of change? Evren, please. Okay, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm really delighted to be uh, with you today. And uh, the question that you asked is a major and a very big question. Let me try to summarize um, some of the systemic factors that are shaping Turkish foreign policy or referring back to your question, um, what are the main drivers of change? 
when we ask this question, what are the main drivers of change, we usually refer to some systemic factors and as well as some regional and domestic factors. And, and these are uh, things that we have discussed a lot, um, not just here, uh, not in the GMF, uh, but uh, in other venues as well. But let me very briefly summarize them. And I want to use a metaphor in order to explain what really changed in Turkish foreign policy. So Turkey has faced um, specifically in the last decade and starting from basically um, the Arab Spring, I could say, and the Syrian civil war, a new combination of opportunities and threats. So uh, going back even to the beginning of 2000s, globally, what Turkey has witnessed, and in fact, what the other countries in the region have witnessed in the Middle East, and we'll be talking about the Middle East today as well, uh, the decline of, or the perceived decline of, or the lose of interest of the Western actors, specifically the American uh, power in, in the region. So this was not um, only in the region, the actors, specifically the Turkish actors, perceived that. Uh, the the Western, their Western partners are not anymore interested in the region. They are not going to devote too much energy, resources, and, and this and that in the region. No order building actor really left in the region in the last 10 years. An actor which is capable of militarily and financially backing a certain regional actor. As I said, the United States used to be this actor. And, and in the last decade, slowly, slowly, uh, we see the change, uh, the, per the change of that perception. So that was one. Um, I mean, um, at a more maybe regional, global level, we see uh, that the perception of the Turkish political elites has changed in the region, and also the reality in the region has changed. As I and and, and this created a lot of opportunities as well as new threats regionally. Uh, Turkey has also in the last decade experienced, as well as with other uh, countries in the region, a conflict region. Region. So we have witnessed a collapse of two bordering states along ethnic and religious lines. And this is very important, in fact, uh, because all these countries have those cleavages uh, domestically as well, which really increase their security, I mean, change their security perception and increase their um, uh, and threat perception, in, in fact. So that was happening. But it, what, we, what we also experienced in the last decade is the rise of regional rivalry along two lines between the Sunni and Shia bloc and within the Sunni bloc. And Turkey has become an important, influential actor or wanted to become an important and influential actor in this regional rivalry. So what we've seen, what we have been witnessing changes at the global level, changes at the regional level, but domestically Turkey has changed as well. Uh, we have shifted a more, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Turkey has gone through a democratic backsliding, decision-making specifically, uh, since we're talking about foreign policy, has become very much personalized and centralized. Um, the regime, regime security, again, after the 2016 coup d'etat, uh, really created a lot of existential concerns uh, within the, um, uh, the governing coalition, which really made Turkey um, shift towards uh, omnibalancing what we call, meaning that the in external actors who are more likely support uh, the regime uh, is seen as better allies. Uh, Anti-Westernism has been used as a political instrument. War making has been used as a coalition builder. And Turkey has also seen um, a lot of, um, how to say, um, transnational activism. This is Kurdish transnationalism, Islamic transnationalism, and this and that. And Turkey has become highly involved uh, with, uh, with uh, this uh, transnational both threats and opportunities. So very, you know, briefly, we could say that in the last decade, uh, the driver of change is the new, this new combination of opportunities and threats that Turkey has been facing. And it happened on so many different different levels that the Turkey's foreign policy has also reacted, reshaped um, by these factors as well, but domestically, regionally, and globally, as I said. But let me focus very briefly again what changed by using the metaphor of Turkey being a hub state. 
<laughs> so we have done um, a, a research of uh, with political elites very recently for uh, the Michelson Institute of Norway, and when we asked uh, to the political elites about Turkey's role in the world, they always refer to this idea of Turkey being a hub state. This used to be Turkey being a bridge state. I mean, I was growing up in the 1990s, and we always heard and 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 referred to Turkey as being a bridge. And the Turkish political elites that time, back in the 1990s, 1980s, uh, used uh, metaphors of Turkey being door, key, crossroads, gate, various metaphors, um, which all refer to this idea that, or to explain Turkey's role um, as a, or, or function, um, as a mediator or a middleman broker between the East and the West. And the identity was basically sort of a melting pot, right? Where you have this East and West together and Turkey aspiring to be to become a Western state where in, and then it can still keep its identity intact. This has changed. None of these metaphors are around now. As I said, political elites and in fact, even the oppositional elites, the ordinary Turkish citizen is not referring to Turkey's role as a hub. What it means to be a hub? I mean, I do think that it's radically different than being a bridge, uh, which used to be, as I said, the main metaphor of Turkey's foreign policy. Uh, as we know, hubs connect many different locations at the same time with maximum flexibility. And in fact, this became the key of Turkish foreign policy, having this maximum flexibility always shifting alliances, but you're at the center. Bridges, as you know, however, are stable transit points, and Turkey's political elites really um, didn't like this idea of being uh, a stable transit point. Turkey now wants to be the energy hub, uh, does mul multiple deals, build pipelines. Turk Stream is uh, get activated just a year ago. Uh, Turkey wants to be at the trade hub connecting Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, for example, East Mat, uh, problems in the East Mat and Libya are both crucial for Turkey's inter aspiration for interregional connectivity. And because these regions really play major roles in an emer emerging nexus of commercial routes and this and that. But this also means, I mean, being a hub state also means autonomy, uh, I mean, plus to the flexibility. Uh, and this idea of autonomy is inherently against fixed alliances. And the Turkish political elites, again, reflecting to the systemic factors that I mentioned, um, begin to this, see these alliances, specifically the transatlantic alliances like NATO, EU, and these formal treaties and defense treaties and mutual commitments, offering no longer offering solutions to the immediate security threats, right? They wanted to keep them, they wanted to be part of them, but they didn't really want to, to have this um, commitment to this relationship. And they thought that they both need that flexibility, but also in order to balance other actors in the region, they also need this back up from these um, alliances. So Turkey's foreign policy sort of shifted both this alliance pattern and also alignment pattern. For example, uh, Turkey's uh, pattern, I mean, relations, bilateral relations with Russia is basically an, an alignment. Um, and you will still have Turkey with, with, with the West, uh, an alliance, Turkey being in an alliance with the West. And Turkey kept, you know, like these two um, different methods of interaction um, together in order to balance each other. So it needed both. And, 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 since, uh, and, and, and in fact, uh, being in an alliance and in alignment with different nations and having this autonomy and flexibility really made Turkish foreign policy, the political elites thought, uh, more autonomous. Um, and maybe one final word, I don't really wanna 
go ex I mean we can ex expand upon that uh, if there are other questions um this really required capacity um this autonomous hub state right uh, and Turkey had initially and still has sort of a capacity like uh, it expanded its military footprints abroad military bases abroad Qatar Somalia Libya uh, helped the Azeris uh, in Syria in Iraq has never been this active uh, it has expanded uh, a domestic military industry um, and specifically drone uh, production a lot in the last decade as well, and specifically in the last five years, and had multiple deals with the regional actors selling weapons drones to them. Um, but Turkey is going through an economic crisis as well. And in terms of its capacity, when we look at it, it's not an order building actor. It doesn't have the capacity to build a, 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 a how to say, a Middle Eastern regional order, right? And it doesn't have that aspiration. And in fact, I want to finish with this idea that we need to change the, the way that how we evaluate and how we see capacity. We usually see capacity specifically foreign policy capacity or military capacity or being present in other nations, I mean, militarily, economically, culturally, as Turkey is doing right now. Uh, mostly in absolute terms. But what has changed in the region in the last decade is that in intervening to these regional conflicts, being present, selling arms, um, or you know, like expanding military footprints, is low cost. What I mean by that, you can intervene with limited number of military finances, limited um, tools, as Turkey is doing right now. The toolkit is arming militias, drones, uh, finding economically self-sustaining force of enrollments. And these are become, these are low cost as well because the costs are not known domestically because of the democratic backsliding Turkey had to. Um, and maintaining this idea of hub state is actually a low cost um, uh, investment, let me say, or it, it can be perpetuated, it can be supported uh, without a lot of um, uh, challenges both coming from um, specifically domestic audience. I'll stop here, but maybe we can expand upon some of these ideas later if uh, there, are in, there are some questions coming from the audience, thanks. Thank you, Evren. In a few minutes, uh, you gave us a, a quite uh, effective picture of the main uh, characteristic of uh, Turkey's foreign policy over the past uh, over the past decade. I would like to turn to to Ian now uh, to ask him uh, from a U.S. perspective. What are the main assets and uh, liabilities in uh, U.S.-Turkish uh, uh, relations? And uh, is Ankara uh, still considered a strategic uh, ally for, for Washington? Valeria, thank you very, very much. And let me also add my thanks, our thanks, I should say, from GMF for the partnership with ISPI. And it's, it's always great to be part of Rome Med. Uh, so thank you for that. And to my colleague, uh, Kadri, as well, as always. Um, no, I listened really with great interest to, to uh, what Evren had to say. And I was very taken with, you know, her thinking in this, you know, mentioning this nostalgic sense from the 1990s of Turkey as a bridge. Um, I remember there being a debate at that time, a little after that, uh, you know, was Turkey a bridge or was Turkey a barrier? Uh, the hub vocabulary, which is very interesting and is very much part of the Turkish debate, never came into it. Uh, it's interesting when you've seen from the Western point of view, especially the American, since you ask, um, you know, you could debate bridge or barrier, but hub Hub is not part of it. Um, you know, the, the key partners in the West are not even clear that they function as hubs anymore. Whether you're talking about Washington or New York uh, or Brussels, uh, Paris probably does still see itself as a hub. But in any case, I mean, this is, is very interesting, though, because it is does go along with this this sort of decade of activism in Turkish policy, which you talked about. Um, 
But that activism was born in a way in a much more benign environment when it was commercially led in some sense as well. Um, and now we have a, an environment that's very much driven by the strategic factors, by the geopolitics, by the security dimension. And there it comes to the relationship with the United States and with NATO. And, you know, I think my own sense is that um, for Turkey, at the end, even though this is very controversial, it's not really optional. Um, you know, the more difficult Turkey's neighborhood has become, neighborhoods have become, um, the more ultimately Turkey needs the strategic reassurance of, of critical defense partnerships. But those are not easy to manage. And I think one of the key, you know, things to be said from an American perspective is that the relationship with Turkey has never been easy to manage. There was really no golden age in this, important at times, perceived as such, uh, but always very difficult. And you know, I think sometimes the United States and Turkey are more similar than we like to admit. Uh, you know, we're big, big continental countries with a sense of our own exceptionalism. Americans use that term, Turks don't usually, but you can feel a little bit of it in talking to Turkey's uh, foreign policy observers and officials, this sense of exceptionalism, that somehow we're different, that we have a special role. Maybe it's as a hub, maybe it's as something else. Um, very sovereignty conscious. You know, uh, I, it's a close thing to determine whether, you know, who is more sovereignty conscious, the US Senate or the Turkish Grand National Assembly? It's, you know, we, we, we both have a sense of our own national purpose very patriotic countries, uh, you might call it nationalism if you like. Anyway, we're more similar than we sometimes like to admit, and this does not make it easy, because uh, unlike the relationship between Turkey and Europe, which has a lot of dimensions to it, uh, difficult to escape from, the American relationship with Turkey is all about security and defense cooperation, largely. There have been attempts to diversify it, but it's never really worked under any administration. Um, we're not close to each other. By some measures, we're not even natural allies, other than, of course, through this very organic NATO connection. Um, so, you know, the tendency in the United States always was to point at a map and say, look at where Turkey is. Look how strategically central it is. Um, and this persists to some extent in the American debate. But in recent years, there has been, and you know, I would end really on this, is to say that there's really been a kind of collapse in the strategic uh, view and constituency for the relationship. Um, there are many sources. You mentioned some of them, Valeria. I mean, there's the S-400 problem, but it goes, it's much deeper than that. I mean, I would say that, you know, you've got a set of dysfunctional uh, aspects that concern practical cooperation. And then you've got a set that are about values in politics. And in recent years, neither one has worked very well. Uh, it's partly a result of what's happened inside Turkey. It's partly a result of things that have happened on the Western, including the American side. But, you know, it's it, the combination has been very corrosive to the relationship. Uh, and at base, and I think this is really critically important, uh, practical cooperation can be fixed, can be finessed. There is an erosion even a collapse of trust that is much harder to fix. And I think you see that at the level of Turkish public opinion, but also Turkish elites. You see it at the level of American foreign policy elites as well. Uh, we simply don't trust each other. And there have been many things that have happened in recent years that have contributed to that. But why don't I, I stop there for a moment? There are obviously some very big differences that the Biden administration, I think, makes, and i can happy to talk about those, but back to you, Valeria. Thank you, thank you. I was just asking, uh, in uh, your view, what are uh, the main element of uh, continuity and discontinuity between the Trump administration and Biden administration uh, in uh, managing relations with Turkey? Well, you know, it's a good question. I think the, the, the continuity is, is all about the geography and, and geopolitics and, and all the reasons why we have tended to see Turkey as being structurally important to American strategy and NATO strategy over the years. That, that hasn't changed. Um, the, in terms of the negative side of this, you know, you've got a whole set of issues that uh, are in dispute between the two countries. Both sides have their own list. The American list includes the S-400s and uh, 
the policy in Syria and Iraq and towards the Kurds. And I mean, it's a long and the but to that has been added under the Biden administration. Those were already concerns for the Trump administration. Religious freedom was a big concern for the Trump administration as well. The Biden administration inherits all of those problems, but adds on to this concerns about the state of democracy in Turkey and media freedoms and human rights and things of this kind, uh, the whole internal, the domestic agenda. Um, so in some ways, um, you know, as much as Amer American administrations like to come in trying to fix things, there is a lot of repair to be done there. Is everything negative? No. I mean, I think looked at for, and I'd be interested in whatever and things, but I think, you know, when seen from Ankara, you know, the discourse about the Muslim world from the Biden administration is very different. The policy towards Iran, they would like to be rather different. Um, there, there are areas where the two countries maybe would be closer together under Biden than they were under Trump. But you also don't have whatever chemistry there was between Trump and, and uh, Erdogan. Um, you know, this, this is not the case anymore. Thank you, Iana. I would like just to uh, remember to, to the audience uh, that uh, it, uh, there is pos it's, it's possible to, to ask questions uh, uh, through the uh, Zoom chat. So please uh, send your, your questions to our speakers. So, Evren, you mentioned before uh, the alignment uh, with, uh, with Russia. And it's a, it's a crucial uh, issue, uh, the, uh, re the relations between uh, Ankara and Moscow. And uh, how can uh, uh, Turkey balance uh, the relations uh, uh, with uh, Russia uh, and uh, relations with uh, uh, the US and NATO allies, in, in your view? <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult. Uh, well, uh, I mean, the whole fact about Turkey's uh, relationship, strong relationship with Russia is basically a sort of a balancing act. Um, if you remember where this relate, when this relationship really began to to take hold was it was basically to counter or balance the American influence in Syria, specifically American collaboration with the Kurds. So it was basically a balancing, sort of a balancing act, right? I mean, the roots goes to the, the to that. Um, and in fact, Turkey and Russia helped uh, one another to become the top influential powers in the conflicts that they intervened. And they sort of balanced the power of the past in all these conflicts. For example, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, the Libya conflict, which is changing now, but it seemed, I mean, even their competition was sort of a balancing act, and, and Syria obviously is there as well. And the cooperation uh, with Russia enabled Turkey to increase its autonomy and this idea of it, I will refer to the same thing as, I mean, I think in the same way that I am thinks being a hub state, no one does that. And it's very difficult to do it. But this perception of being a hub state and autonomy um, really was very important. I mean, the, the cooperation with Russia was very important in uh, sustaining that perception as well. Um, cooperation with Russia um, not only uh, enabled Turkey um, militarily um, to intervene in these conflicts and to become a very influential actor in these conflicts, but also enable Turkey to assert itself as a normative power, effectively challenging European norms of humanitarian intervention, democracy, and this and that, and sort of balancing the influence of the West. Um, and cooperation with Russia enabled Turkey to show the external actors to the Western powers that it has ways to overcome conditionalities, right? Uh, specifically, for example, when it comes to the arms purchases, we know that uh, in, with the S-400 deal and this and that. Um, so lots of balancing act going on um, with Russia. And, and when we refer to the Russia Turkish uh, cooperation and relationship. But at the same time, it was not just, you know, like balancing um, West um, by cooperation with Russia, but as I said, um, it is basically balancing Russia by 
the West and by using the Western um, alliance. So positioning itself within the Western security architecture has been giving Ankara an edge over Moscow and makes it able to balance the Russia in the region, in Syria, in Libya, in Nagorno-Karabakh, everywhere. So this is certainly a balancing game, maybe a balancing act, you would say. But the future of this cooperation will mostly relate it to the position of the Western actors at the end and answer to a couple of questions. Um, the first question is, how much cooperation can the West offer? So Turkey does not just only have this perception of Turkey being a hub, but there is also this idea that Turkey is under attack, right? I mean, I, I'm not gonna specify that, but that is really there. So in terms of that cooperation, what could the West offer to Turkey in terms of countering Kurdish transnationalism, in terms of refugees, in terms of failed states building up the Syria, Libya, very important and all these questions. The second question that we should answer in order to see the future of Russian-Turkish cooperation is how much autonomy Turkey can have. Uh, as I said, you know, like this idea has been all about autonomy. I mean, this new foreign policy has been about autonomy and Turkey had a certain autonomy in a sense because the Western actors backed up from the region. Um, so the question is whether Transatlantic alliances support to Turkey is conditional on Turkey's coordinating with the West or not is a key question. So there should be a whether there should be a coordination with the West, specifically when aligning with Russia, is the most important. Uh, question that we should answer. Uh, and the Western actors have not been so clear and so consistent about that issue so far, which opened up Turkey a lot of autonomous uh, space. And finally, this is something I mentioned with the Biden administration, and this goes again to the question of democratic backsliding. Uh, the, the problem, I mean, how much norm compliance uh, the Western actors would expect from Turkey, specifically in terms of its domestic politics, human rights, and this and that. That may create another fissure as well. And, and, and given that Turkey is not just contesting the West, but in, in, in terms of the norms, uh, but sees itself as a genuine, genuine norm setter um, in terms of the refugees and this and that, and really um, underlines this principle of sovereignty, uh, not, you know, like um, the West as um, uh, sort of violating this principle when say something about democracy promotion or or human rights violations and this and that. So that would be uh, the third um, problem area in terms of um, shaping Turkish-Russian um, cooperation in the near future. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Evren. Very, very clear. Uh, and uh, you mentioned the, the point of uh, compliance uh, uh, to human uh, human rights, democracy, and uh, rule of law that are the, the principle uh, at the basis of uh, uh, EU relations with, uh, with Turkey and uh, with uh, all uh, candidate uh, countries. And uh, so let's move to EU-Turkey's uh, relations. And during the latest European Council, the EU presented a positive agenda to relaunch the co cooperation with uh, Turkey. And Iana, in your view, what are the main uh, obstacles on, uh, on the path uh, to reset EU? Turkey, uh, Turkey relations and what are the most promising sectors for, for cooperation on the other side? Valeria, thank you. You I mean, the, the negotiation, uh, the accession uh, issue yeah. that uh, for the moment. I mean, the, the, the accession project, you know, is really at an impasse. So the question is, for the moment, uh, and, and out to the medium term. But everyone tends to take the long view, because if you just look at the short view, it's rather, it's rather depressing. Uh, you know, so I think both for Washington and for Brussels, a lot of the engagement with Ankara these days is, in a sense, a bet on change coming in the future. I mean, political change does happen. 
And, you know, in terms of Turkey-EU relations, <clears throat> it's about elections in Turkey. It's about forces in Turkish society. It's about the long-term kind of impetus for convergence with Europe. And, you know, after all, <clears throat> I mean, my, some of my colleagues on, the, on this, uh, on this uh, call will have a much better sense of this. But, you know, I think it's true that for at least 200 years, Turkey has been off again, on again, perhaps, but in a pretty steady way, converging with Europe. And in various ways, norms, policies, all sorts of ways, practically, commercially, culturally. Uh, is, that, is that at an end? I don't think so. Uh, and I don't think anyone would bet on that. So, you know, there is a kind of longer term perspective here that, that influences this positive agenda. Um, it's, it's a matter in some ways of stabilizing the relationship rather than perhaps resetting it entirely. Um, I mean, there are some things that are absolutely essential to moving forward with accession that are simply, th there doesn't seem to be any prospect of them moving forward, like a, a solution to the Cyprus dispute. Um, but short of that, there's a lot that could be done. And, you know, it goes back to this point about the differences between the United States and Europe in this regard. You know, a lot of the relationship with Turkey for the United States is optional. For Europeans and for Turks, it's not optional. Uh, cooperation on uh, migration and refugees, cooperation on counterterrorism, the diaspora connection, the commercial, the trade and investment connection, which is so, so big. I mean, you know, Europe and Turkey cannot, cannot get away from each other. They have to have a policy towards one another, whether it's highly functional or not. And, and I think that's sort of what you're seeing now. Uh, you know, one thing that's really come to the fore in recent months, especially, has been the question of what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean. And, and that's become a, a kind of key measure for many in Europe, also in the United States, for the relationship with Turkey. And the fact that this is now somewhat calmer is probably a positive uh, point. Um, can you have a progress on the customs union? Um, I'm not so sure as much as many people would like that. I think the mood in the European Parliament and elsewhere is, is not really con conducive to that. Uh, similarly on, uh, on visa reform, visa liberalization, but on other things, uh, you know, a kind of revamping of the deal over refugees, um, uh, you know, some sort of new construct in the Eastern Mediterranean, which Turkey could have a more active role. I mean, there are lots of things that are possible, um, but it's not the big accession project, which is really at a standstill for the moment. Thank you, Jan. So, um, thank you very much. Many questions uh, arrived. So, I have a question to, uh, there is a question to everyone. What should the volume of GDP to, um, of GDP um, to, uh, for uh, an autonomous, uh, for Turkey to be an autonomous uh, hub? And uh, uh, what, uh, what is the impact of uh, uh, economic difficulties uh, on uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy and uh, relations with, uh, with the West? I don't know the level of the GDP, <laughs> but it's very it's difficult to question. measure, uh, you know, like the relationship between autonomy and the level of GDP. So I really don't know. But certainly there is a relationship between the trade levels and the economic growth and eco not just that, but also economic um, or let me say differently, development models, right? Uh, so Turkey uh, used to have um, more like construction sector oriented developmental model, right? Um, and it still goes on. For example, you can understand some of the Turkey's military interventions by following this model, uh, why Turkey is in Libya, why Turkey is in Africa. It really is related to, the, um, to this developmental model that Turkey has been pursuing in the last two decades. And also the defense industry has really one of the drivers of, I mean, has become one of the drivers of Turkey's foreign policy activism itself. It enabled uh, really Turkey to intervene um, to, um, to these conflicts. And it also created a lot of, you know, like economic, um, uh, how to say, uh, 
growth um, in, in terms of our economic expansion uh, in the defense um, industries. Turkey certainly is going through an economic crisis, crisis. Uh, keeping the trade levels high, keeping the economy intact is one of the priorities of Turkey. But whenever we try to understand foreign policy, we need uh, both uh, to look at the macroeconomic picture, but also the specific needs of specific sectors that are booming or that are creating a certain sort of a developmental model. So uh, what I'm underlying here is the Turkish, def we need to look at the Turkish defense industry uh, in order to understand the dynamics of foreign policy and Tur Turkish construction sector as well. Turkey is very much, for example, competing uh, with Russia to rebuild the Middle East, uh, failed states of the Middle East. So there is a lot of economic uh, competition going on for really scarce resources in the Middle East. It has become difficult for Syria, uh, and, and it, it is going on in Libya. Um, so economic competition and competing, co co competing for uh, these rare resources or rebuilding these societies is one of the motivators of Turkish foreign policy. And unfortunately, going through an economic crisis doesn't decrease this sort of um, foreign policy acti activism. In fact, it increases that, even though the capacity uh, may be less. But this is something what I said. These are sort of, you know, like low, um, low cost. I mean, intervening these conflicts are low cost. Thank you. Thank you, Evren. And a question to, to Ian. Uh, what should we expect from the recent Turkish application to the PESCO initiative on military mobility? Well, it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, that defense industrial piece of Turkish policy has become, as everyone has said, very, you know, very prominent uh, for the economy, but also as uh, an element in Turkey's foreign policy. And, you know, the United States has just been um, allowed into, if I can say, parts of this initiative, along with Canada, I believe, as well, uh, and perhaps one other country. Um, so there is, an, I think, an increasing uh, willingness uh, in the EU to envision uh, non-member states playing an active role in this, um, in this uh, permanent and structured security cooperation, uh, in, especially around military mobility, but also other issues, including some production issues, possibly. So um, I think there will be a willingness to see Turkey as part of this. Uh, there may be those who would like to sort of hold that hostage to other issues with Turkey. That's possible. But uh, I think there's a lot of advantage to the European Union and also to NATO, frankly, in seeing Turkey play a more active role in cooperative security ventures. Thank you, Jan. Uh, we are getting to the end to, uh, of this uh, first part, but uh, I would like to quickly ask uh, uh, the last question, and I apologize uh, if we don't have time to, to uh, ask all uh, uh, the questions I arrived. To both of you, very quick answer. Uh, is Turkey eligible in the eyes of the current US administration to be invited at the summit of democracies to be organized by President Biden. This is for Biden to decide. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, I mean, I, good, good yeah, answer. No, I, I mean, look, I, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this because obviously this is not the most comfortable aspect of a relationship, even if it's to be reset in some fashion. And so, you know, my sense is that the administration would invite Turkey and probably Turkey would want to join. Um, won't be an easy conversation, but of course, Turkey is not the only case in this regard. Uh, there are others even within NATO where this is going to be challenging. Um, and I, so I think, you know, the administration, as much as it wants to put this, my administration, as much as it wants to put this set of issues at the center of American foreign policy, uh, is going to have to have a you know, a somewhat wider debate than, than just among those who don't raise any issues in this regard. And frankly, who these days does not raise issues in this regard? If you look at what's been happening in the United States in recent years, things that are happening inside the European Union, we all are sort of worried about our democracies. Uh, so, you know, why not have Turkey as part of that conversation? Thank you very much, uh, Ian. So we are at the end of uh, the first part. 
Thank you again to Evren Balta and uh, Jan Lesser for uh, their insightful uh, in intervention. I leave the floor to Kadri Tashtan, who will moderate uh, the second part uh, of uh, this uh, virtual panel. Kadri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kadri Tashtan. I'm senior fellow with the GMF in Brussels, and it's really my great pleasure to moderate this part of the discussion. So thank you uh, for staying with us for this second session. We will focus more on Turkish foreign policy in the Middle East. Well, before starting the discussion, let me to introduce briefly our two speakers. We have uh, Dorothy Schmidt. Dorothy is a senior research fellow and also head of Turkey and Middle East program at IFRI, Institut Français de Relations Internationales. Uh, then we have uh, our second speaker is Galip Dalai. Galip is uh, at the Kotz Center for Applied Turkish Studies Fellow at German Institute for International and Security Affairs at SWP. He's also a non-resident fellow for Brookings and Doha Center and associate uh, sorry, fellow at Chatham House. So Dorothy and Galip, thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, indeed, in recent years, Turkish foreign policy has surprised many observers by its posture in the Middle East and by its almost systematic approach based, based on confrontation and the balance of power with regional and international powers. Obviously, Turkey's Middle East policy has shifted in responses uh, to global uh, and regional development as well as, cha uh, as changes on domestic political scene. And for example, the shifts in the U.S. involvement in the region and the growing role of Russia have put Turkey in a difficult position to perform, to perform a balancing act between the two powers. And we have also seen, as it was has been, it has been mentioned during this first session, several military engagement of Ankara in the region. The most important ones, of course, are. Uh, in Syria and Libya. Uh, furthermore, Turkey has engaged in an intense competition with the Saudi Arabia and UAE axis through the region. And as a result, Turkey's new, missed the new uh, Middle East policies characterized by heightened threat perception, uh, per perceptions, zero sum competition with other regional powers and the increasing uh, resort to the use of military forces. However, in recent months, the news has uh, been coming out of Ankara regularly about normalization in relations with the countries with uh, which Turkey has had problematic relations for some time. So uh, obviously there are a lot to discuss we have, we, and we have a great panel for this. And uh, we will have two sec two round of questions with the, our speakers and of course we will open up for your uh, for the audience for the q a Galip, i would like to start with you and uh, you will have for five minutes for this first round earlier i have mentioned some characteristic of turkish foreign policy maybe you can shed some light on this before you will tell us more about turkey's recent normalization effort in the middle east uh, what are the drivers and what would we anticipate in, ter in terms of outcome? Uh, go ahead, over to you. Uh, well, well, thank you and thank you very much, Maria, ESP and GMF for this invitation. And I also very much enjoyed uh, the remarks of Evren and uh, Ian. And uh, these remarks certainly helped me uh, to prepare my remarks for uh, for this part. I mean, I can start with the question of the Biden's democracy uh, democracy summit. The question is, is this a democracy summit or is this an anti-Chinese democracy summit? Uh, if this is an anti-Chinese democracy summit, I mean, certainly India will get an invitation and certainly Turkey should get uh, an invitation. So uh, I am like, uh, I mean, this democracy summit first and foremost should be judged by the quality of uh, or, the, or the preceding words, that's uh, the word that precedes uh, democracy. Uh, returning to Middle East, uh, I think, I mean, one thing in terms of the Turkish policy in the Middle East, we see uh, many changes during the AK Party era. Like when you look at uh, between 2002 to 2000, uh, up until the Arab Spring, let's, uh, let's say it, uh, some of the quality was the following. A, you had an economy first approach. B, you had a country that were trying to speak to 
all countries and poles uh, in the Middle East. C, you had a country that tried to be like active in regional institution from the GCC to Arab League to OIC, uh, to OIC. D, you had a country that tried to kind of like cultivate a role for itself through mediation facilitation. Let's not forget like, you know, Turkey was holding talks between uh, Syria and Israel, between different factions in uh, in uh, in uh, Lebanon, uh, uh, like you know, in Iraq uh, was trying to do uh, the same, the similar things. And D, the last point, uh, you had a Turkey that uh, whose Middle East policy back then was pretty much in alignment with that of the West. I mean, there was a point of friction or disagreement between Turkey and the West. Uh, it was clearly during the Turkey's rejection of uh, the U uh, Turkey's rejection to allow the US to use the Turkish soil during the uh, Iraqi invasion. But nevertheless, when you look at the broader context of this broader contour of this policy, the Turkish Western policy was uh, quite in, uh, in, in alignment. With the Arab Spring, you had a country that saw a new role, the prospect of a new role uh, in the Middle East and in broader international affairs by championing the new waves of the protest in the Arab world, which Turkey saw that it's, it will, you know, these waves of the pro uh, protest in the Arab world will change the nature of the governments in uh, Arab states that are experiencing these uh, waves of protest. And then the uh, the, the uh, and then the movements or the power that the group that were supposed to come to power would be quite Turkey friendly. So in a sense, the Turkish idea was that this new wave of the protest will produce a regional order which will be very much Turkey friendly, and therefore Turkey will have a leading position in this new uh, uh, regional setting. And 2012, one can say, 2012 was the year in which we saw some form of a proto-regional order uh, that Turkey uh, liked to have. Uh, you had like the, uh, the changes of the government in many countries, like in Egypt, in Yemen, in Libya, in Tunisia. And back then, Turkey thought that also a change in Syria was within the reach. If 2012 was a year we saw a proto-regional order, the 2013 was the year when everything collapsed. I mean, first domestically in Turkey, from the Gezi Park protest to the power struggle with the Gulenists, Turkey became much more introverted. At the regional context, you had the, uh, you had the coup in Egypt, and then you had the Assad using the chemical weapon against the uh, its own population, which was designated as a red line by Obama, and Obama simply did nothing. So uh, that motivated Turkey that actually the West are not that keen on the on this regional transformation as it thought that it was uh, during the early stage of the Arab uprising. So 2012 was, uh, in a sense, uh, in a sense, uh, as I said, like you know, we saw some form of a proto-regional order, uh, but the 2013 was this uh, this decline and unraveling of this so-called proto-regional order that Turkey uh, wanted to have. And then uh, starting from 2015-16, you see a Turkey that has highly uh, mi uh, militarized and securitized up approach to the Middle East. From 2016 until 2020, this is the period within which where you see uh, the Turkey's military activism in the region was it, uh, at its peak. If you set aside the first Turkish military intervention into the Syria, all other military intervention took place during the Trump presidency. And that's an important factor because the Trump presidency made those military interventions relatively cost-free for Turkey. Secondly, during this time, the Turkey, uh, uh, Turkey uh, A, in terms of capacity, Turkey was uh, quite uh, visible in these areas, but also Turkey cultivated new experiences as well too, working with the militia organization, non-state actors, engaging with, uh, engaging with cooperative relations uh, in an extensive manner uh, in a regional, con uh, in a geopolitical context with countries like uh, Russia. So those are like, you know, some of the basic uh, feature of uh, the Turkey's uh, policy back then. But what did, what happened to Turkey back then was Turkey increasingly became isolated, both at international, but also at the regional uh, stage as well too. The, the number of countries with whom the Turkey had a criminal relationship with has, expand, uh, has expanded. And Turkey, even though the relation with uh, Russia was uh, improving, 
but the, uh, the, the relation with the West was experiencing quite a difficult uh, period. And this is the background uh, we should keep in mind while discussing the recent attempt. The recent attempt, there are several drivers. One of them is one uh, speak, uh, can speak of the broader drivers. The broader drivers include the change of the presidents in the Washington, and that already put a systemic constraint on Turkey. The secondly, the domestically, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the economic crisis in Turkey, because the economic crisis in Turkey made some of the Turkey's previous policy extremely costly, particularly when it comes to Eastern Med in Eastern Mediterranean, given the fact that Turkey was facing the prospect of the EU sanctions. And then on the top of this, you see uh, this regional and international isolation. On the top of it, I will also include the prospect of a nuclear deal between US and, uh, and Iran. That will not have a direct impact on Turkey, uh, Turkish regional policy, but a deal with Iran will affect the nature of the regional blocs and the relation between the regional blocs uh, in the Middle East. The more specific reasons for this outreach was the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey's isolation in the Eastern Mediterranean, and concern about the emergence of a some form of a regional security and energy order in the Eastern Mediterranean, which ex excludes Turkey. And then secondly, the, uh, the Libyan conflict, which pit, uh, in which Turkey, uh, which pit Turkey against a plethora, uh, a plethora of countries that includes uh, Egypt, UAE, uh, France, etc. So what should we anticipate in terms of the outcome? I think we should not anticipate a big uh, breakthrough. Uh, this recent uh, outreach should be seen more as an ice breaking rather than a breakthrough in terms of uh, Turkey's relation with Egypt. The, the, the countries will meet each other in a sense, you know, in a way, what, what here partially. Uh, what that means, I think the Turkey, the Egypt will not sign a maritime demarcation deal with Turkey as Turkey wants. But the Egypt will be much more conscious of Turkey's position and Turkey's projection of its own maritime border when it comes to signing deal with the third countries or the international energy companies. On the Turkey's side, I think the Turkey is already uh, pressuring the Muslim, uh, the Egyptian opposition and the Muslim uh, brother affiliated uh, media organization in Turkey. We already saw this uh, happening. But Turkey is in Istanbul because many of them already have either Turkish citizenship or legal residence. Uh, and uh, highly likely we might see the exchange of ambassadors between the both countries and more engagement uh, and ministerial level engagements between the both countries. But a presidential level engagement are not in the, uh, uh, are not in the, in the course. Uh, finally, on Libya, Turkey can be more flexible on Libya because in the end, uh, there is a difference uh, between Turkey's approach to Syria, in which like, Turkey is less flexible, and to Libya. Uh, and and the, the, Galip, uh, the reverse sorry, is the I, case for... Galip, may I interrupt you? Sorry to interrupt, but could we keep maybe the Libya for the second round? I have a question related to that. To be, okay, sure. You, you can uh, go in this question, the second round. Sure, sorry sir. to interrupt you. Sure. Uh, Dorothy, I would like to continue with you. Actually, I would like to ask you about uh, the, the implication and the challenges of Turkish foreign policy in the Middle East for the West. And maybe you can also bring this Russian-Turkish cooperation uh, angle in the Middle East. What are the implications of this cooperation for the relations between Turkey and the West? Also, I would like to have your opinion, your view on that. Over to you. Uh, bonjour Kadri, bonjour Galip, uh, hello everybody. I hope you hear me correctly and I hope my connection will be all right because Great. sometimes it's a little weak. Um, so now that Galip has sort of uh, brushed the, the backdrop very extensively, um, it's easier for me to be super analytical and short. Um, I wanted uh, to start with your question, of course, about um, how the how Turkey... Uh, defies challenges or perturbs the West uh, in their approach to the Middle East. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was when I started um, working on Turkey, uh, one very important issue that was uh, watched very closely here in France, uh, in Paris, by the way, which makes, of course, everything I say about Turkey uh, specifically aggressive, probably. Um, you know, we've been approached by a think tank to do uh, 
track two with Turkey, by the way, uh, because the, the relationship is considered to be so tense with Turkey that now we, we need to have track two. I'm making interviews with um, uh, French intellectuals about uh, the, the feasibility of Turkey's accession to the EU. Turkey's uh, um, not only the, the, the engagement, but really Turkey being part of the EU. Uh, and uh, Robert Badinter, whom some of you may know, is a very famous lawyer who's been uh, who's a sort of moral authority in French uh, political life. Told me he saw he was very much in favor of Turkey's inclusion into the EU politically, and he thought it was very important in terms of diversity, also to have a a, a, a big power, but also a Muslim country uh, pertaining to the EU, including the EU. But he saw one very important uh, difficulty. Turkish borders. Turkey has borders with Iraq, Iran, Syria. All these countries are problematic. And so we need to keep Turkey out because Turkey is going to be the sort of the buffer zone. And I think uh, what the, the Europeans feel now is that Turkey is making the Middle East closer to us first, but it's making the Middle East also more chaotic because of its own commitment to some uh, difficult fights in the Middle East. So. Uh, I think the issue of borders is very important for the for Europeans. Turkey blurred its own borders in the Middle East with Syria specifically through the Syrian process, through its engagement in Syria. And it's also uh, posing as a model or, or as a leader in the Middle East, which means that it's acting from within the Middle East now. So Turkey is not considered anymore as a country that is in between the two zones. It's it's considered as pertaining to the Middle East entirely and wanting to have its um, most important, you know, the very important part of its status is to be, to exert leadership within the Middle East. And then the this new hyper-presence of the Turks in the Middle East is problematic because it has autonomous drivers. We don't share Turkey's main concern in the Middle East. Very clearly uh, talk about the... Uh, the, the, the Kurdish uh, driver, for instance, uh, or uh, talk about the religious driver, uh, all sort of determinants that uh, the EU cannot align on uh, when Turkey is, uh, uh, is becoming more, uh, uh, more active and more, more has show, showing more ad adventurism if you want, in the region. Uh, of course, Cyprus is clearly uh, also a case where uh, uh, the Europeans have lots of difficulties understanding the Turkish uh, attitude vis-a-vis -vis on the, on the Turkish uh, probably on the Cyprus problematic. But we discussed this with Kadri, and he doesn't think Cyprus belongs to the Middle East. So we leave the Eastern Med out of the, of the picture. Uh, so Turkey has autonomous drivers in the Middle East, and then its its actions becoming more and more militarized, just like Galip said, which is also a problem from for some of the member states of the EU who were used, and France clearly is one of them. The UK was the second one, but now the UK is out of the EU. So France considers itself as uh, the one military power who is likely to intervene. Uh, when some uh, difficulty arises in the Middle East. And now we've seen Turkey becoming more and more bold and efficient militarily. And the competition is also playing at a um, commercial uh, level, of course, in terms of uh, selling weapons. Uh, so that's the second problem. Turkey's policy becoming more militarized. It's third problem, which is especially... Um, um, which we see very clearly in France when you talk to French decision makers, uh, whether from the on the uh, political side or the, the military side, it's the fact that Turkey is um, uh, proposing a doctrine. It has a sort of global imperialistic discourse, which is also a revanchist discourse in this region that's making global sense. So it's, it's extremely, uh, it's, it's a dynamic that's... Uh, uh, bringing the Turkish people behind their own leadership, whereas here we have difficulties on taking people together uh, on, on the idea of taking external action. And this global discourse is utterly disruptive for, for the EU, uh, for the Americans maybe less, but at least for the EU. So this all puts the allies under stress, clearly. It divides them 
And we do a lot of work on the Franco-German differences of approaches towards Turkey because we diverge on uh, many, many occasions on uh, how to deal with Turkey. Like the French want to put more pressure. They're ready to go quasi to military escalation while the Germans want to negotiate. Uh, the French have this sort of uh, fantasy that the Germans will use their uh, economic clout to put pressure on Turkey and they never want to do it, etc. And Galip knows this because he's in, sitting in Germany, so he knows we have this constant dialogue over uh, how um, uh, firm uh, you should be with Turkey or should you indulge into a, a sort of a more socially acceptable uh, dialogue with Turkey while the Turks are insulting us all the time, etc. So it divides the EU partners, but it also divides the EU and the and the US. I think there is there's I see a transatlantic rift looming there, also with the Germans aligning on the US a lot more than the French would like them to do. Uh, we have traditional differences of approaches between Americans and Europe vis-à-vis -vis Turkey. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the idea that you should not interfere into internal affairs of Turkey or internal matters has always been a very strong, I think, parameter for the Americans. So even if the Biden administration arrived in power with the reputation of uh, uh, being uh, uh, sort of more uh, morally structured and wanted to put pressure on human rights in Turkey, I think it's clearly a burden that the EU should assume more than the Americans because they have no strategic interest to do this. And, you know, my uh, concern was that actually the Biden administration would pressure the EU uh, to become more uh, uh, friendly with Turkey because they need Turkey in the Middle East and they know we are a very important link in, uh, uh, and we can offer Turkey uh, uh, especially economic um, incentives uh, in order to uh, accord, to, to accommodate Turkey's ambitions in the region. So my concern is that actually the Americans and the Turks will get along maybe at the expenses of the EU, of the core interest of the EU. That was the first part of the question. I've been very long. Second part, Russia um quickly uh i think maybe the west is the the west americans and the eu are the, the strongest cement for relations between russia and turkey in the middle east actually uh this is a sort of uh, playing the alternative um but the countries are two competitors by natures by nature we'll see the developments most probably in africa in the in the future very quickly so um in the end uh who wins depends on their real objectives. They don't necessarily have the same objectives. I think the Turkish ambitions symbolically, politically are, of course, much stronger, much bigger than the, than the Russian ambitions in the region. Uh, but also, I think they can accommodate actually one another because they don't, they don't fight together on issues that are vital to, to their own sense of identity and integrity. Again, see the very ambiguous attitudes of the Russians vis-à-vis -vis the Kurdish issue, for instance. Uh, and see also Turkey's relative inconsistency on Crimea, the Tatar issue, etc. When you know that it's really that the teasing risk going too far, you abstain. You abstain from interfering in the, the other's internal affairs. Merci, merci Dorothée. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Galip, uh, so let's continue with you. Uh, you can continue to your analysis of the first round, but. Uh, I would like to have your comment on Libya, obviously. Given that we are entering in the political phase in Libya, how is this affecting Turkey's uh, Libya policy and, and goals and aspiration in this country? You will have two, three minutes this uh, for this round. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, I mean, what I was saying is the following, because one of the point of disputes between Turkey and Egypt is Libya, obviously, because... Syria is, Libya is to Egypt what Syria is to Turkey, uh, uh, given their long uh, borders, uh, given their long borders, because the Turkish shares have very long borders with Syria, which makes Turkey quite inflexible uh, uh, within the context of uh, Syria. I mean, the question of long borders, the question of, you know, the cursed PYD, SDF, etc., is the factors or the prospect of refugees uh, is the factors that make Turkey 
more inflexible in Syria. And you have the same uh, the, the factor, uh, similar factors for Egypt in Libya, a long border, security concerns, the prospect of more, let's say, you know, uh, Islamically leaning actors in uh, Tripoli. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the uh, when it comes to uh, Egypt asking Turkey to withdraw the Syrian fighters from uh, from Libya, on there theoretically, I think the Turkey is open uh, will be open uh, for the withdrawal of the foreign fighters from uh, Libya because in the end, I don't think that it needs it at this stage um, uh, as a security actor, but it needs it as a leverage because it will conditional, it, will, it wants to condition the, uh, the withdrawal of the Syrian fighters from uh, Libya based on the withdrawal of the other actors, uh, including the Wagner, actor, uh, uh, Wagner forces, the Russian Wagner forces, including the pro Haftar Syrian fighters from Libya. So this is more of a bargaining chip in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for Turkey. So the question for this is what are the, uh, like how does Turkey look at the, uh, this uh, diplomatic process? Broadly speaking, the emerging picture uh, from the diplomatic process is largely positive for Turkey. Uh, the prime minister is an actor, uh, is a figure that is very close to, uh, very close to Turkey, a figure from Mistrata, which is the Turkey's major uh, power base in uh, Libya. Uh, and the Turkey has uh, the the Turkey has networks or the structures already in place uh, in place in Libya that can help Turkey to project influence. Uh, secondly, the Turkey that does not want to bear the cost of further flare up or further escalation in Libya because the escalation will mean uh, you know most uh, most uh, more turbulence for Turkey in its relation both with the West, but also with the Arab countries with which now Turkey wants to normalize its uh, relations. And unlike Syria, in Libya, geopolitically uh, speaking, Turkey and the West, if you put aside uh, particularly the friends, Turkey and the West does not have much geopolitically competitive interest. I mean, they will have more economically competitive interest because Turkey and uh, Italy are on better terms on Libya. But when it comes to business deal, when it comes to energy deals, highly likely this interest will be more competitive. So at this stage, the question would be, what are the Turkey's goals? The first one, Turkey would want to make sure that uh, the, uh, the economic deals that it signs, the deals that it signs with the GNA will remain intact in one way or another. The second, the Turkey wants to keep the Libyan-Turkish maritime uh, deal because this is crucial for Turkey when it comes to Turkey's uh, projection in Eastern Mediterranean. The third one, the Turkey wants uh, like a bigger share in the Libya's economy, uh, economy infrastructure uh, uh, and, and the finance and the energy uh, sectors. The fourth one, the Turkey wants to maintain the strategic assets and then the uh, and then uh, the strategic assets that it has in Libya, particularly when it comes to military bases, both both naval and the air bases in Libya, the Turkey wants to cling uh, onto them. And then the fifth one, right now, you see that Turkey tried to institutionalize its influence through in Libya, through the institution building, through the army building, through the secure sector reform, the army building, the army training, military training, are. Uh, basically, uh, low cost, high impact uh, efforts for Turkey, and it is already doing this in Libya. The last point, uh, Kadri, in terms of when it comes to you know uh, the future of Turkey's military presence there, I think the Turkey, uh, as I said, like when it comes to withdrawal of the Syrian fighters from Libya, Turkey it will be more flexible. But when it comes to withdrawal of the Turkey's uh, military presence in Libya. I like the Turkey will resist this idea because it will argue that it has signed the, this is the result of a deal that it has signed with the Libya's UN recognized government. So there I think the Turkey will be more inflexible. Thank you so much, uh, Galip. Uh, Dorothy, in this second round, I would like you to, to focus maybe on a bit on uh, Turkey-Israeli relations, because I see that there are many questions related to this too. Turkey was also trying to normalize uh, with Israel previously, and I would like to have your comments. What were the driver and goals of this overture? Actually, Galip has already partially answered those questions, because it's also related to the East Med conflict, uh, uh, obviously. And how this recent conflict is going to affect this process? I can may also maybe bring some question 
that uh, audience are also ask. And for example, someone is asking, what do you think are Turkey's intentions or interests behind behind its being at the front uh, forefront of criticism of Israel following the latest tension with Palestine and Gaza? Another question is asking is uh, if uh, with Erdogan government, is there any hope of a normalization of the relations between Turkey, uh, Turkey and Israel, etc.? Uh, you, you you will have th- three four minutes to answer you because we we also added some question from audience. The the Q and A session is open. Please go ahead. Okay, Kelly. So I suppose there are two um, two baskets. One is uh, normalization. Is it possible? Why blah blah blah. And the second is uh, why is it flaring up in the other direction? Actually, uh, so uh, the normalization with Israel uh, is uh, is a sort of illustration of the very unpredictability of the re- the relations between the two states that have gone through up and downs historically, but are. It's a special relationship, clearly. You know, Turkey was the first Muslim country to recognize Israel historically. They were very close to Israel at times. Uh, When the Ak Party came into power, there was a a lot of analysis uh, emanating from uh, Israeli think tanks trying to uh, um, analyze a a potential shift, concluding at the time that it would not change anything because the strategic parameters that uh, bring Israel and Turkey together uh, close um, with regard to the rest of the Middle East are so strong that actually the Turks could not go in a direction, in the other direction, could not turn their back to Israel. And then there was basically 20 uh, 2008, uh, nine, and the until the uh, the Davos incidents and the uh, Mavi Marmara incident, and then uh, everything changed overnight. And I remember talking to uh, uh, Israeli guys in um, uh, very powerful Jewish organizations in the U.S. saying that they missed Turkey and that it was a an enormous problem from, for them to draw a new strategy without Turkey, to um, imagine the, their future in the Middle East and the secure future for, Indra, for Israel in the Middle East without Turkey. Um, but in the end, they had to uh, get used to it because just as Galip has described in his first uh, answers, uh, it's a very long way to normalize the relation. But now, there was an illusion since the beginning of this year that Turkey was again, you know, in this diplomacy of all possible mood, uh, which has, I think, two drivers, actually. On the one side is the idea that Turkey has to act as if it were omnipotent. You know, it's almighty Turkey. Uh, it's the your credit. So, as we say in French, plus c'est gros, plus ça passe. Like, you know, when uh, Erdogan, after a very, very difficult year with Emmanuel Macron, extends his hand in January and says, OK, let's forget everything. We need a fresh start. He doesn't get an answer from our side because nobody believes that the fundamentals have changed. And we know competition is still there. And we know the uh, uh, potential, the, the disruption that uh, Erdogan has brought has not uh, pacified the region. And, uh, and that is it's, it's bringing structural problem, problems to the region. So one point is Turkey uh, acting as, as if it were omnipotent, could do anything. And the other is a very practical attitude. Any should, anything should be tried as long as you can draw benefit from it. And that's what... Uh, happens with Israel, of course, because at times the the balance between the uh, uh, benefits and the liabilities is really in favor of, you know, getting closer to Israel and reconciling with Israel. Um, what I want to say is that with this new Palestinian crisis, precisely the parameters now go in the direction of a confrontation because Turkey sees this as an opportunity to assume leadership again. The narratives that Turkey has been building on uh, for years now, the Palestinian narrative supported by Turkey, national Palestinian narrative, the Muslim narrative, they kill Muslims there. We need to uh, wage a war against these people who want to do bad to the Muslims. Uh, And third narrative that's very important, the, the terrorist narrative, Erdogan and his ministers, constantly labeling Israel as terrorist. And we know Turkey has its own definition, his own categories of terrorists, like Feteh, 
uh, the PKK, uh, people that Turkey has problem with, but problems that are not necessarily shared by the rest of the world. And now Israel can be labeled terror as terrorist, and it's 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 it uh, it makes more credible if you want the use of the word by Turkey because they see that Turkey was maverick, and now. Israel, if you return to the blame game, Israel can bring the blame from Turkey to Israel. But then what do the Turks offer now when they stand for the Palestinians and they, they're they just uh, stirring up tensions? Uh, they want to enlarge their footprint in the Levant. That's very important. We've seen them active, very active in Lebanon last year, which was a surprise to us. So uh, they, want, they want to be more active in all Arab constituencies and Muslim constituencies in the Levant. Contrary to everybody who's making more effort for peace, the Turks are mixing war to peace in their discourse. They're talking about being more offensive with Israel. They're, going, they're talking about fighting with Israel. And I think this per se condemns their attempt. It doesn't make it uh, legitimate or audible for the rest of the international community. Uh, and in case there's a, 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 a multilateral peace device that's being uh, set up, they offer to send troops, to send peace troops to Jerusalem. I can just imagine the Quai d'Orsay, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, working on this hypothesis. This is, this is an absolute, uh, this is a, a, very, a very dreadful, you know, perspective, I guess, for the French to see Turkish troops. But imagine for the Israelis, this is just a non-starter, it could never work. Thank you so much, uh, Dorothy. Gali, two questions for you. Uh, how, uh, from the audience, of course. How deep is the uh, Turkey-UAE uh, regional rivalry? Uh, rivalry? A and it is reconcilable. Uh, this is the first question. The second one, how has Turkey's relation changed with Iran over the past years since the assassination of Soleimani? Of course, Dorothy, after uh, Gali, you, you, you are free to jump in. If you want to comment. Go ahead. The in the first one, we see a bit positive signs. In the second one, we see it, uh, many negative. When it comes to Turkey UA rivalry, I mean, this rivalry had uh, different elements personal elements, ideological elements, and geopolitical elements. For long, the ideological elements was the most prominent one because the UA has positioned itself as the most anti-Arab Spring country, even more than the Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, but up until, uh, particularly up until the MBS became the crown prince, previously Saudi Arabia had kind of a piecemeal approach to the Arab Spring, whereas like, in Syria, in, uh, in uh, it, you know, it certainly uh, supported the coup in Egypt. It was one of the countries actually engineered the, uh, the coup, whereas the UAE was uh, anti-Arab Spring, uh, the most avid anti-Arab uh, Spring uh, country. And the Turkey, uh, obviously, in the regional context, uh, situated itself as the most pro-Arab uh, pro Spring uh, country. And then what was effectively ideological later gained more, uh, more geopolitical uh, flavor with uh, context like uh, uh, Ukrainian in both contexts, the uh, UAE be quite active, but also through the Qatari crisis, where the UAE and Saudi Arabia problematized the nature uh, of Turkey's military presence in uh, in Qatar, which uh, they saw as their backyard. Particularly, Saudi Arabia sees as its backyard. But recently, we see some positive signs coming from the UAE. To what extent that can lead to anything is still yet to be seen. But nevertheless, you see an, uh, you know, a relative reduction of the tension. Uh, this is still fragile, that can be reversed, but uh, at least uh, this is the case. I mean, here maybe it's important we speak a bit about uh, Saudi Arabia as well too, because you see actually Turkey sending quite many positive signs to Saudi Arabia. Recently, the Turkish foreign minister was in Riyadh, I mean, uh, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, actually, uh, if you put aside the Turkish military presence in uh, in Qatar, which Saudi Arabia sees as its backyard, there isn't much uh, geopolitical incompatibility between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. The main reason for the tension in Turkey-Saudi Arabia relation is the ideological and the personal one. 
uh, I mean, the ideological one is obviously related to the Arab Spring and the nature of the relation to the political Islamic uh, factors. But the personal one became much more acute after the Saudi killing of the Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, in uh, the Saudi Council General in Istanbul. This element has turned uh, the nature, has effectively turned the crisis into a personal vendetta between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. So when we analyze the Turkey-Saudi relation, we should not, uh, we should not like, uh, uh, we should not lose the sight of this personal vendetta element uh, in Turkey-Saudi relation uh, uh, relationship. Otherwise, when you look at it geopolitically, you don't see much, uh, much uh, this disputes uh, between in between them. Despite this, Turkey highly likely will be, uh, you know, still adopting more post position towards Saudi Arabia. Highly likely it will adopt a more pro-Saudi position and discourse on Yemen. It will keep uh, uh, it will keep reaching out to Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, despite the fact that Saudi Arabia is effectively putting an economic boycott uh, on Turkish goods, and then recently announced that it's going to close on the Turk uh, eight Turkish schools. Well, when it comes to Iran, the Turkish-Iranian relationship will get more tense as we go forward. The reason for them are multifold. One of them, the previous context which brought Turkey and Iran closer, is no longer there. I mean, by the previous context was uh, is the following: previously during the Trump era, Turkey believed that the Trump is supporting the emergence of as some form of an order that will be premised on Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, Israel, and that will be supported by uh, US. The, this regional order would not be only anti-Iran, but it will be anti-Turkey, but also it will be anti-political Islam. This shared concern about this regional order is what brought Turkey and uh, Iran. Uh, and the, the things like the Qatari blockade, and then later the Iraqi Kurdistan referendum, was other factors that brought them a bit closer. But now there is a new president in the US, so there isn't the prospect of such regional order in making. So the broader framework that brought Turkey and Iran together is no longer there. On the top of it, the number of disputes in Turkish Iranian relations are increasing. I mean, the areas of geopolitical competition. It's not only in Syria, now you have in South Caucasus, because after the recent Nagorno Karabakh uh, fragile. Uh, or the emerge after this conflict basically has increased Turkish role in this uh, uh, in South Caucasus order has given supremacy and decreased the Russian uh, decreased the Iranian role in this uh, order uh, and in Syria when you look at uh, the discussion between uh, in Syria when you look at the nature of the discussion on uh, Idlib but also on northwestern Syria Effectively, Astana trio of Turkey, Iran, and Russia morph into Astana duo of Turkey and Russia. That is also quite un, uh, unpleasant uh, for Iran. Uh, Iraq. In Iraq, there is a growing dispute between Turkey and uh, Iran. And also on, on the regional Kurds, you see that, you know, Iran is Iran uh, allies, Hashishabi are forming some form of close relation with the pro-PKK element. All of that means that we are going to see a turbulent period in Turkish-Iranian relations. Thank you so much, Kareli. Dorothy, we have two minutes to end the meeting. Please. Can I add a few, just a few oh, words absolutely. to what Kalib has said? Um, I think in the relationship with the UAE and also arguably with Saudi Arabia, there's also this symbolic competition. There's a competition of political models, of social models uh, with Gulf monarchies which are aristocracies, plutocracies, uh, to Turkey. Um, they po Turkey portrays them as an incarnation of a divine moral uh, pattern also. And I think that was very clear with the Khashoggi affair. Um, and Turkey wants to show that it offers an, an alternative model to integrate Islam and politics in a wider sense. Um, we um, recently had um, a Saudi minister visiting uh, Ifri who was mocking Turkey's uh, appeal to the Ummah to defend the Palestinians and uh, Turkey's, you know, efforts to uh, show itself as a, as a Muslim leader. Um, clearly, the, the Saudis don't believe that it can work because they think Turkey has no legitimacy to pro producing um, um, 
theology and producing um, religious leadership. But the Turks think that they in, they, they can incarnate a sort of uh, uh, a modern uh, version of this uh, uh, combination of Islam and politics. Uh, and with Iran, I fully agree with the Ghalib on all the you know the files, the different uh, issues and and places where the relationship are going to be more complicated. I think all change with the Biden administration, which is in a very um, ambivalent again um, uh, posture, saying that they want to revive the GCPOA, but now they're trying to set the um, balance of power in their favor with Iran. So they're putting. A, a different sort of pressure, maybe a more militarized kind of pressure with Iran. But still, I think there is one channel to um, bring close to Iran, which is, of course, the economy. I mentioned of the, of, 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 of the Silk and Road project. Um, the Chinese basically think that the, it's the moment to, to buy Iran, if you want, because Iran is still isolated and it's basically broke because of the maximum pressure sanction policy of the US. Uh, Turkey needs money. So uh, they probably need also uh, Chinese investments. And I think this is uh, one uh, channel that uh, also in the past uh, was very effective and was very um, important for the Turks to maintain their relationship with Iran. Thank you so much, Dorothy. With, with that, unfortunately, I have to apologize to the audience because we have to end the meeting. Uh, Galip and Dorothy, thank you so much. Uh, it was terrific, and I would like to also thank to the audience, of course, for joining this uh, mad discussion and also for contributing by their question and comments. Uh, and hope to see you soon again in another mad discussion. Valeria, I don't know if you would like to say something over to you. Thank you, thank you, Kadri, and I would like uh, to join you in uh, uh, thanking all uh, participants, uh, uh, all uh, our uh, speakers, uh, our panelists, uh, Gallip and uh, Dorothea, thank you very much. And last but not least, I would like to, to thank all my colleagues that uh, behind the scenes uh, have worked to make uh, this event successful. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.